Hello everybody, uh, my name is James, I'm a bookseller here at Grolier, and I want to welcome you all to uh, this reading here on the snowy night. Uh, hello everybody on Zoom, thank you for tuning in. And uh, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome Janet McFadden to uh, the stage tonight to introduce the poets for the reading. So without further ado, here's Janet. stuff that's happening in Ukraine and wars around the world and I really start to think that it's important to affirm how I'm not saying this very well. I haven't talked in front of people for two and a half years. <laughs> 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 yeah, so I just, we have to affirm being together and the power of poetry has to build communities of hope and perseverance. I don't know how else we get through this. So yeah, I'm the managing editor of Slate Ruth. Of Slate Roof Press, and we are thankful to the Grolier for inviting four of our poets here today Susan Glass, Richard Woolman, Anna M. Warwick, and Catherine Stearns. And Slate Roof is a collaborative press. We're based in Western Massachusetts, and we've been around since 2004. We focus on new voices in poetry, and we make them um, in these beautiful editions chapbook editions. Um, our members are involved with all aspects of publishing, everything from um, vetting the manuscripts, from providing feedback, from um, assembling the books. We have book assembly parties to put these together. This, this, um, and marketing. And Ed Rayer, who is our printer and master book designer, works with each poet so that every book is a reflection of the poet's voice and their desires, and we use all kinds of die cuts and fancy papers and local artwork. So, yeah, so mine, this is my book, The Die Cut of the Moon. You open it up and you come to a full moon and open it up to the title page, and it's an increased full moon, and then you go into, so we'll get to it, full artwork reveal. Um, so, I'm going to go through each each of the four, read the bios of each of the four poets and show you a bit about their books. Um, Susan Glass' new chapbook is called The Wild Language of Deer that won the Elise Wolf um, Prize at Slate Roof. She has held a community, she has held a residency at the community, Cummington Community of the Arts and received her MFA from the University of Massachusetts Amherst after teaching at San Jose University and West Valley Community College, she now co-edits The Blind Californian for the California Council of the Blind and the newsletter for the American Association of Blind Teachers. And just to give you a quick introduction, there is this die cut on the cover uh, with a woodcut of this deer that is just bursting through. Um, the, um, the next page, there is a braille, which is, it says the title, doesn't it? Susan? Yes, yes. It says the wild language of deer. Um, you go to the title page, which is not readable as a blind person, but it does have braille um, lettering on it that are all in the shape of deer hoof prints, because Ed Rayer went overboard in it, in this book. Um, full view of the die-cut deer that is finally goes through this cover here. And then there is an entire poem in Braille. You couldn't do more poems in Braille because it's such a wide medium um, to do. But this was Susan's shortest poem, so we made a nice little Braille fold-out. Um, and Richard, Woolman's book has just come out. I've never seen it before. So, Richard Woolman is the author of Changeable Gods, which was also a winner of the Slate Roof Elise Wolf Prize. Um, he's also published Evidence of Th Things Seen by Sheep Meadow Press and A Cemetery Affair um, from Finishing Line Press. His current manuscript, An Art of Need, is about outsider artists 
His poems appear in the New England Review, Crazy Horse, Prairie Schooner, Notre Dame Review, and Poet Law. He is professor of literature and creative writing at Simmons University. And Richard's cover is a painting by Richard. He's also an artist. And Richard, you want to show people more fully in the book. For the title page, there is a wood sculpture, right? Yeah. Wood sculpture on the title page, and that um, the texture of that is also repeated at the end. Here, like that. Um, Catherine Stearns, this is her book. Um, Catherine Stearns is the author of The Transparency of Skin from a New Re Rivers Press, which was a finalist for the Minnesota Book, book Awards, and her chapbook, Then and Again, which won the annual Slate Room Press Chapbook Contest. She has received grants and awards from the Iowa Arts Council, the Dana Award, the Loft McKnight Foundation, and the Massachusetts Cultural Council. Recent poems may be found in the New Ohio Review, the Yale Review, Calix, and Terrain.org. So here's her book. I think um, Kate will um, show you more about it when she gets up. And then finally, we will hear from Anna and Warwick, her book here from the other room. Um, Anna's publications include From the Other, other Room, which was the winner of Slate Roof's first annual chapbook contest. And she has two chapbooks, Horizon and Smoke and Stone. I think one of them is right in front of me here. Her poems have appeared in Madison Review, Harvard Review, The Sun, Phoebe, and elsewhere, and have been set to music, performed at the Hayden Planetarium, Hayden Planetarium, and permanently installed in the Boston area subway station. She also will show you more about her book. And in case you're interested, Slate Room is having our annual contest opening on May 1st. So if you want to look us up www.slatewoodpress.com will be there. So without further ado, please welcome Susan to the class. sit to read, not because I feel like sitting, I'm actually a walker compulsively, <laughs> um, but because of the braille display that I'm using um, to make this work better. Can you, you still see? Yeah. Okay, okay. It is such an honor to be a part of the Slate Root family, and we are a family and community, and I think for this purpose, yes? Yeah, that's better. Um, and uh, when Janet was talking a moment ago about the books themselves having a voice, I never understood that until I became a part of this collective, that a poetry book, the voice is the voice of the poet, but it's also the voice of the words on the page, and it's the voice of the medium, and the space, and uh, the art, and um, the texture, and the culture, and, and everything. And um, there's, there's even a fragrance to it if you pay close attention. It's very special. And so I'm just delighted to be a, a part of this community. So uh, I will read a few things from um, The Wild Language of Deer. And um, I always begin with a very, well, not always, but tonight I choose to begin with a very short dedication. Uh, the book is dedicated to my mother, Flora Louise Duffy Bailey, um, who was my twin through my whole life until she passed on and made so many beautiful things possible, including the art of paying attention. And so this uh, little opening dedication is to her tandem a two-speed Schwinn, its 30-pound frame, frame grounded, that you bought so I might continue my sightless escapades, with no more plowing into parked cars. Kindness does that to you. What was it like to be the mother who allowed that to happen? Mama, you knew I could not be penned in, windowed in, walled inside the kind of soundproof, spellproof houses that were in the West. That's for every parent in here. Why did I allow her to do that, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
This is a poem called Judy Bedtime Story, and it grows from an early, very early gardening experience with my mother on a summer evening. It also was my first theological excursion. June Bedtime Story. In the wild light before cataracts, God was marigold seed sprouting from between mother's fingers. My first nursery to water and smell. Together we tamped the earth our forearms and knees touching. She stood, and I, child got at ear level with patchwork knees, listened to a wheelbarrow on stone, pulled by mother hands, earth gloved and honest. The flapping burlap apron of mother lap, the snips, the trowel. God became dwarf plants, and plastic seat packs, and spiderweb roots clinging. And the seedlings, they got eaten, smelling of onions. I crouched in the basin our knees had made, unsure how seed graves could spawn life, afraid of leaving them to their dark work, afraid of running away. Thank you. This is for Janet. Um, and uh, having just arrived, here by the usual means, I'll share a, a, a dream poem about travel, which would actually be more interesting to just sort of tease. Time is a guest here also. We have come by night, or rather slipped cog by cog beyond what passes for night in midsummer Sweden. Everywhere a mist, from out of which potato beds and crocuses rise. Likewise, a terrace all spread for tea herring, thin bread, coffee, meandering talk, sentences that doze. I keep watching the sky transfixed by light that lingers, wanes now minute by minute, regains the next morning. The terrace shivers, melts into a bedchamber of blowing pastel curtains. I feel the absence of a journey. No bags, no books, no afterlag of air flight. Only the sense that I left without notice, my wife's self, myself as daughter. I listen from this chamber as you and your mother talk. The bedclothes smell of linden trees. I dream with beautiful alarm of those I left behind. And, um, I will now read the title poem, The Wild Language of Deer. Um, so much appreciate my colleagues help understanding who this deer was. Um, very mythological, um, very female, very angry. <laughs> Not Bambi. Um, <laughs> the wild language of deer. The deer appears in my living room, and I throw down every myth I've ever read. Great stags in the Danish king's forest, northern stars flickering in their antlers. Artemis buck avenged. Irish berries milking hinds. This doe's bones are harder than the maple piano. Her hooves puncture the oak floor, cut jagged frail stanzas to the kitchen's rim. Her knees dispose of chairs, her shoulders thrust musky scented into the breakfast nook, and the head mounted over the fireplace is like any face emerging from a dream that bewilders, that asks, what is this place? Her body is a dark space under basement stairs where we flatten together on our bellies. I pull wet sentences from the clay of her flanks. They smell like fermented potatoes. They are the mute story I'm telling of her furious, severed head. They are poems that will never domesticate, that welcome this wild language back into my home. You know, language is, a, is, I've never tried reading this one aloud. <gasps> Big breath. Um, la language is um, the way we learn about the world after we learn about it through our senses. And the way my life worked, I learned everything from listening to nature first. And I believe things like birds made the sunrise and flowers stun you, but they will really be easy when you find out. Anything. I just had all this stuff mixed up. But what happens is that then you encounter human language and it gives you words for the things, the natural things you love, the objects you love, the concepts you love. 
but the language can change your perceptions of them all. So this is called object language. Say dog. The animal is solid, shoulders, haunches, bone. You know the fur be because you see it. The fur is not in the word. Say perro. See the jowls now? The bounce, the bark. Perro, 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 tail, tail, tail. See she yeah. This word whispers for her. Whis whiskers, regal, carriage, upright ears, a shepherd. Cat, shack, gato, gato, gato. An ambling, maimed, coon, cat, warm eyed, glad to ride on your shoulder. Shat is in a, shat is small, in a hurry, carrying fish. Cat's tail arches over its back. Horse, caballo, cheval. Cheval pulls a sleigh and caballo rushes cows. Horse jumps to the point of the ride as English often does. Tell me, how will you spend your points? Your miracles, your mercredi. If you belong to Wednesday, your shoulders may slow with your diminishing days, your eyes on the radar, your charm and changing horizon. Mercredi and Mircolis will have you wrangling at a farmer's market or grasping the standing room only pole on the street corner. Mm -hmm. I think we need to hear a word. Mm -hmm. Should it be the woodpecker or the bird? Listening blind to a Buick's ring. This melody is symmetrical, practiced. La 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 he lilts from an oleander bush, rests three measures, then la 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 Siebert. His tail must be conducting. A black barred, white tipped baton curved over his back and flicking side to side. Does his tail drive his music? But the music is tail. Halfway through my steaming coffee, he changes tunes. Ta, ti, 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 as though juggling mistletoe berries till their speed becomes a trill. Ta, ti, 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 The trill bounces through toy on shrubs, so I turn my head to follow it. Cha, 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 cha. His scoldy, his wife's. Cha, cha, cha. Z, 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 z. His collars pounce in a tangle of leaves and twigs. I imagine his upward curving bill snatching a beetle, swallowing it whole, then borrowing a sycamore leaf napkin. Silence, and now for much further on. Sweet, sweet, sweet. The same wren or another. In my next life, I want to be his bold white eyebrows and his ventral wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> what? I, I need someone to tell me about time, please, because I, I didn't time these. So I want to be polite. You can talk for a few more. Yeah, a few more. Okay, would, would somebody just, you know, say one more minute or something like that? Just, it's kind of like those kids, you know, all right, you've got three minutes to get out. Okay, Tommy, it's one minute. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I will read. Uh, this is called Word Photos, and it's written for two beloved Helens. And it's also got some mythological reference to it, and it's um, about the same people I dreamed of in Sweden. Word photos. Helen, who blesses his fathers, carries a tear gas, runs alone in San Antonio Park, mothers the boy whose mother neglects him. Helen, who sculpts bronze demons, gathers onions for a centerpiece the way other women gather flowers, whose dogs whelp pups in her bed, whose voice over the telephone is wind and sage brush. Helen, who each June yearns for Stockholm, for the neighborly melody of Yerudan soul, midsummer planting, and her father, soul of forest, to stir in his bed, and with able hands and legends, set the two worlds right, the green and wet one plowing beneath stars, and the one of tectonics and lava, whose violence is not rage. Someone comes for us from one of these, for Helen, a reindeer cow parts evening water, wading shoulder deep, and 
since North is one end of our planetary day, her birth into the heavens will be quick. I told you that this was dedicated to my mother, and this will give you a pretty quick picture of her love and her philosophy. Oh, shut up, just read it. <laughs> She's all melody and she's all melody and size of this work. One hand feeding blue venom past with this exact needle, the other guiding and flattening it alone the flattening. She curses the ripped out seam and wasted yardage, the dining table and sewing tray, rip rack, a tired marking wheel, and discarded spools. Her feet sing on the treadle. Her eyes slide between pattern and dress, for seeing the bodice before it becomes hot. Our next half hour is bobbin and spool, her hand smiling. She tugs and sips and marks the clock just so. Our next half hour is yank and pin scratch. Her smacking yardstick just misses a sandaled toe. She circles around me, her mouth full of pins. Damn it, stay straight. You will be the daughter I am sewing you to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, time, should I stop? Yeah, you got to one more. Okay, okay. Um, I'm ready to read the last dream. I'll read the synesthesia poem because I I went to, a, I went off into jazz festivals in San Mateo College, um, in their outdoor, and uh, it stand up your hand in the morning, you can kind of go in and out all day long. There's saxophones over here and singers over here. And, um, music can cause all of your memories and senses to erupt simultaneously. Gravel, lips, very thorn. All the along the thighs, hips, and dancing blood wait. And finally, music arrives. The last day of July, the hot breeze comes alive with the inland rivers. Choose the melodic hill. The jazz flutist pouring catulpa trees and watery nets. Some people reach for parasols, most riot and dance. Inside your jigging bones, your heart remembers older summers. They rush in like ballads. You mouth their lyrics, their half-formed smells. You label them hemp rope, boathouse, windmill june, gravel, lips, fairy thorn. It occurs to you, to any other mind, this collage is random. So you inhale as though your lungs are eggshells. You hope no one will see you cry. I'm still under the spell of that wonderful reading. Thank you, Susan. Um, one of the poets last week called Grolier's A Sacred Space. <laughs> and um, it, it's truly an honor to be reading here. And I wanted to, to thank you to James and to Anna and, and everyone at Slate Roof uh, for including me tonight. And congratulations to Richard. Um, my chat book, and again, is largely about the, the language of memory, and how memory expands outwardly, how history remembers, landscape remembers. Um, I, I, I want to just show you one thing. This is uh, the cover, and there is a wonderful, it's taken from the picture by an artist named Carlin Marcus Ekstrom, who is here tonight, and um, 
Her work is very different. Her, her recent work is very different than this, but I wanted to show you that. Um, I'm going to read a couple of poems from this chapbook, but mostly I'm going to read new things. Okay, this first poem is an ode. Um, or maybe not. I think most odes are, are celebratory. And this poem, at the end of this second year of the pandemic, and now the beginning of the Ukraine war, is definitely not. Um, it's, it's in the imperious voice of the season. Winter. I give you the risen world under your boot soles, with clean edges and negative space, which you insist upon filling with human silhouettes. Remember untwisting the chains of the green swing, your mother in the kitchen gesticulating to your father in the living room in front of the TV, each one framed in a different window in the cold, clear, early evening air. When you felt their separateness, what did you do? You kick higher and higher, letting snow fall on your upturned face. I give you space to look around, a perfect balance of silence inside and out, wherein all your questions dissolve. But what would you do with answers? I give you time necessary and sufficient, although time and time again, undeterred by history, you sentimentalize my rigor for the man of the moon or goddess stars. I give you the distinction you crave, each branch of each tree in the raw, glazed, distance, out past rooftops, far, far beyond whatever you'd imagine there. Of an evening's walk, I give you brightly lit windows into other lives, discreet and brief and undisguised, with a stringent air to make your skin tingle. At first you shiver, then a calm suffuses as if your eyes could burn through crystal. Hurry, you must hurry, step away before the vision ends. This winter, numbed by field after field of whiteness, the stubble and mounds reminding you of people lost. I give you yourself, scrabbling at the door for warmth. From the kitchen window, Whose children are they flinging out their arms, eyes shining, breaths visible, limbs arcing in the snow? Luckily, as far as we know, winter is still followed by spring. <laughs> Shadbark. The trees at the arboretum are sucking themselves up to bloom. I can tell because of the ornamental barks lace bark, paper bark, shag bark, which used to wag their greetings as my dog and I walked by, now fan skyward, up and aloof, as if to leave mere visitors behind. These trees and Molly got me through the winter. I try to pay attention to what they say. For weeks, the message had been the same, bird call, my father's, buck up, buck up, buck up. But today, inside of spring, although all confer mass on memory's rasp of crows. Some even dare to imagine what's worth blooming for. When Molly scratches herself on a hickory tree, I stroke the dappled bubble. Shagbark's blossom and end, radiant high point of the unknown. Question, my father said, what is Bulebase? Answer, my older sister Susan said, reading from a dictionary, a fishmonger's stew. Question, my younger sister Maddie horned in, what is fishmonger? After he pulled from the freezer the smallmouth bass we caught that summer at Crystal Lake, we walked to Fahrenbacher's IGA for shrimp frozen, cod frozen, and clams frozen. None of us liked fish, not even the fish sticks they served on Fridays at school. And today, it went without saying, no back talk, no meltdowns. Question, my father said, where's your mother's meat cleaver? <laughs> when no one could find it, he took his axe and hacked away, <laughs> thrillingly, the 
fast as blank gaze. <laughs> Maddie and I peeled the shrimp, and Susan got to heat the oil in the big cast iron skillet. Question, Maddie said slowly, reading, what is extra virgin? <laughs> Our father could laugh and cry at the same time as he chopped the onions and taught us to sing La Marseillaise while we danced around the kitchen. When he opened the wine, he poured a little for each of us. Cheers, we shouted, clinking our orange juice glasses together. We must have used every pot, pan, and utensil in our mother's kitchen, and almost every spice on her twirl of spice, spice rack, rosemary, basil, margarine, tarragon, fennel, fennel seed, and thyme. Just before we sat down to eat, I said, trying out a new voice, not unlike my mother's, and who's going to clean this up? <laughs> After a strange and wondrous fishmonger's feast, we all did. We tried and held our father in our sight for as long as we possibly could when he stepped out into the night to smoke his King Edward's cigar. <laughs> Pray song for Zatar. One herb in the royal perfume to dab on the underside of a wrist, the stalk of another to daub lamb's blood against avenging angels. To cleanse me, cried the psalmist, that I shall be purified. But throughout the intimate furies of history, some lovers dreamt with their tongues, blending time with marjoram, sesame seed, suna, sea salt, pure flavors conjoined so that none gives up for scent. That concludes the food portion of the reading. <laughs> This, this poem is called uh, Sonogram, and it's for my granddaughter, and includes a line at the end for Marianne Moore's The Mind is an Enchanting Thing. Sonogram. Where does it come from, what we imagine? You, little zygote, direct an actual link, blooming in all directions. You, too, will root around for brighter light. I picture you now in a single brush stroke head, neck, shoulders, precise, adjusting, unrestrained hatching of a hidden most heart with a burst of beats always new and a murmuration of echoes. Already you form layers of deeper and nearer pasts, weaving relations like the folds of a dress, like invertated roof tiles, like fossils coinciding with different species of birds. Little goose, little dove, pulled up inside, what do you know of unconsoled history? Yesterday's snow overflows the ground, loving us by its scale of need. And still you come, you who flower within like memory, like the mind, feeling itself as the blind. Like purple blue morning glories pouring over, under, through. We can peg the stems in falls of sun or rain. I'll show you. Any given earth will do. You know, I butchered that line by Marianne Moore. It should be feeling its way as though blind. Uh, forgive me. <laughs> Tool shed. Ingress to the right, past the sun-struck peonies, as gorgeous as roses, but readier to dance. Where you collect your trowel and spade, sure of your strength and skills, that your eyes will teach you, your ears hear clearly, whatever words you need. Soon you have filled your basket with greens and flowers for friends and neighbors. You speak as a friend and neighbor, dancing to the music of the wind. You call this your life and might have flourished in it, having prepared the soil and delineated bound borders until another peony opened, this one in purple thread on a kimono worn by a stranger waiting for chemo, shorn like the rest of us in our suits and jeans. How soon egress on the left, how long shade keeps the buds 
clenched tight. Having used up all your arguments, your mind exhausted by a single beat, your eyes expecting the foreclosing dark, and your ears, if they catch the sound of voices, words spend themselves in a mockery of wind, turning them round and round, whether scraping the ground, or ready to ascend. Finally, two short and recent poems. Twenty twenty. A low hanging sun, like the white head of an old woman, rises from earth, her cries unheard, even in a sky bereft of birds. Out of winter's light, the sun carves heroic trees, branches bracing their load in the wind bark overlaid with shadows, surprised and not surprised. At the end, she whispered, you do not die alone after all. You die with everyone you ever failed to love. And because I can't leave it there, <laughs> I'm going to read a final one. Here is pleasure, here is mother, and a creaky porch swing, rocking and rocking into original dark. And here, the baby burrow in a constellated body, hers and not hers. When she, mother, sings of a mockingbird, she, daughter, improvises with a bell like, ma, ma, ma. When she, daughter, had butts his stomach, she, mother, grows extra arms like a goddess. And when she, daughter, wants the wind to kick up, her mother's tattered scarf flies up to and beyond the trees. A tumble of trees, moving faster and faster, until she dreams her mother's dream of an infant tableau, row after row of women whispering in the dark, entreating the future, echoing the past. They fall asleep tracing a cheek's milky sweetness, awake when children forsake their long beds, almost marching as they move away. Thank you. several students to go on to the writing life. Um, and he's no longer with us, so I would just like to dedicate this reading to him. So yes, I'm Anna Wara, and uh, this is From the Other Room. Uh, it is a book of loss and living with loss. Um, and uh, this is the title page, again, Ed Rayer, the designer, and it's a, a reflected room. And, and you could think of that as the other room. Um, our, our beloved dead live within us in that room we keep for them and in our dreams. In real life, they are dead. My mother and sisters wave from the window of the train. 
They smile, almost laughing, and nod at one another. They look out at me on the platform and wave again. The train goes, sounding just like a train. The clacking begins, the chrome lines blur, and this departing happiness stays with me, like some treasure of the first time. The first time I knew, the first time I knew, I was really alive among people and birds, the white lilies and white chrysanthemums. Yes, so we think it's spring. Spring's lament. So it's April again. The trees all hue and shape of green. Mottled, bright, leaves feathery, yellow green, blue green, branches budded and bud broken open. Each tree has, wants its green. Although my sister has been dead three years, it's good that trees turn to leaves each April, unstoppable. Even the great hole in the earth that swallows everything, terror, abiding love, greens up. So a tree turns green and green and green. Then there's a shade. I will not let go of that. The shadow under the tree, dark, deep, forgiving in all that green. Forgiven. That's what I meant. This is another dream poem. He said, they are the dead, you know. In the dream, I hear voices from the other room. So I walk into that living room. But they, a man in a dark business suit, listening to a woman in a blue dress and pumps, are just standing up from the sofa, turning away, plans made toward the doorway at the back, and they start toward the other room, where also voices, conversations. They are taking their papers and leaving the room I entered through another door. I never see their faces. The plans, and they are going. Should I? Yes, I'll follow. Unconcerned, they do not call or look back, might not even know I am. I never see it, the other room. I am anxious and go to the door that opens into an unlit hall, and their backs spread like to the dim. So I'll read a, a few new poems now. Musica Universalis. I rock back and forth on a large boat which carries my 19 notebooks, print and script in my hand, in ink, blue, black, green, red, English, stapled, wound wire, and glued 
bindings. Awakened by a phone alarm, stopped with a fingerprint. Check the news. A huge brown buffalo, face on, horns are from curled fur, symmetry of eyes forward, could be about to say something. Today, Mars and Earth trade lines of code, data sent to scientists. Some blips and pings become pictures. A wind backs into the microphone, out breath from a planet colonized by devices. In England, a farmer discovers an old man and young woman buried together in a Saxon grave, and each has a spear, a shield, a knife. I empty my grandfather's ashes into the Atlantic. Waves take the dust and bones. Chilly for dinner, I'm being called, still snowy. <sighs> Ladder. The way I think I know the world. Instructions on how to cable a device with the right plug, a recipe for kohlrabi, the lane yellow line for the car coming toward me, orb weavers measure space with filaments draped in tall grass by the sidewalk. Crickets claim night's air in late summer cooling, rub leg and wing, sing and mate. All the way home, I'm thinking, two stories high, I fell off. The ladder slid beneath. I landed on it, bent it in two, and survived. Ran around the yard like a dog that had been hit by a car, but my legs worked. My flapping arms were whole. Different outcomes to every way. Creepy crawlies, labeled pests, pesticided. There is a place I cannot get to, across railroad tracks, a factory wall tagged by cryptic black and white initials between trains. One phrase clear, shot, shot. last one. Um, I'm thinking that my next manuscript might be uh, about silence. Uh, and this is a dozen for silence. Fragments, splinters, people break it. When you watch me dream, is my pulse also soundless? If I forget my dreams, do I forget I have slept? Passers-by hold expectation unvoiced. Rests in music produce music. The augers wash the feet of a person shrouded by dust. It could be said, I do not exist. Then I wonder when I will speak. An aspen quaking in the woods. The quiet bird flies. Did you hear the bird fly? Past, the unsung past. 
monks fast so they might hear whether God speaks. Alone, or with one person, or with several, how does my stillness differ? A person wreathed in silence wears branches of feathers. dedicated to Sarah Hannah, that's why I mentioned her. Uh, she died in 2007. And, well, we'll read one of her poems. It is right. Don't laugh at her book, because it looks like it's called Gang Ants. But it really, her first book was called Longing distance. Um, she wasn't happy about it. <laughs> but Sarah, who was dry and sly and funny, uh, found a way to make that just the right thing. So uh, here's what she wrote a lot of sonnets. Um, and this one is called You Are Perseus, but I am not Andromeda. <laughs> And I picked this one for tonight just because it, it captures her, uh, her wit, her humor, but also uh, the sadness underneath. It's all there. Uh, to begin, I'm pale, but not that pretty. Tied and sad at times, but not completely helpless. Although my circumstance alarms. Parents mill about waving their arms. You know you could win them over. You dove down and won me. Half drowning, I was reedy, a clutch of swaying tendrils in the sea. I was softened in that silly cove, blindly feeding, green and pliable. Then I rose for air, and there, like coral, I changed my disposition. I'm the muse, but not the maiden. Yours. Eyes. Fresh, chaste, and dowry, you, you think you're due. I'm the jagged rock you cling to. <laughs> I was uh, with Sarah uh, two nights before she died, and uh, going over her second book, which was called Inflorescence. They're both from Tupelo Press, if you want to go and experience something wonderful. Uh, and, and, and I 
loved it. You know, I had vetted it. And we, over dinner, I tried to convince him that it really was good. And, uh, and I noticed that there was so much about her childhood in the book. And she just said, Richard, memory is a ruthless contraption. <laughs> So here's to you, kiddo. I'm going to read the epigraph to this book. It's from Jack Gilbert, one of my favorite favorites. A uh, poem called Tear It Down, which kind of tears me up. Um, he writes, we find out the heart only by dismantling what the heart knows. By redefining the morning, we find the morning that comes just after darkness. I, this book is about the mornings that come after darkness. Uh, I started at the same time that I started with sculpting, and then all this was happening. And basically, it's a sequence of 30 poems, quite brief in between. And I was sculpting all night, covered in bandages, band-aids, because I didn't know what I was doing. I was cutting myself a lot, uh, but pressed on. And I would find, about four, I would quit. I'd watch the sunrise because why not? I'm up. And so each poem was for 30 days writing an email, describe, writing a poem to my girlfriend, uh, telling what I saw, but using the sunrise as a departure. Ultramarine at its darkest point, but not so dark that black trees can't be seen. And soon each branch and leaf slick from the rain will have itself lined against the sky. The black cows grazing the pasture along Scotland Road don't mind the water on their thick hides. They don't have minds affected by weather. Hooves in the mud and all that spatter won't stop a cow from reaching down and eating the delicious grass. It won't stop anyone who knows that rain is allowed to be rain and loves it for being so. Like I love the furrowed field of your brow when a storm implants itself there because it needs a place to go before it clears. This is the next morning, Jesus. Cerulean and nothing else. Nothing, because the sea took everything. A single cloud might be comforting, a reminder of how blue blue can be. But not today. The sky won't have it. Nothing to mark the place we've been, like last night's sky when I left you. Orion tilted and reeling, the handle of the dipper pointing to the earth like a dangling chain you in your jeweled bed while I drove between the constellations. How hard it is not to hate the morning. I would if you weren't here on my skin. And one more consecutive morning. <coughs> the sky is beautiful and hard, a turquoise ringed by opalescent clouds. I don't know these gods who use the morning for their pleasure, the way they change the palace so rapidly. Don't they want a place to return to? This light is a burnt out flame from a galaxy no longer warm to anyone. Lines of geese begin to trumpet in the evening and leave. Until you see what I see, I will have never seen anything. My mind displaced from anywhere I could call. No trace of wind to carry off the last leaves, but doesn't it seem that some of them can't possibly last another second? Wouldn't it be easier to give in, let myself fall to the ground, and join those who have withdrawn into themselves and begin another morning? The snow that came yesterday only toughened those last skeletons. 
I'm staying in the landscape, edgeless and inviolate, until the next storm comes to take the rest away. Without color, the clouds look thin as they try to make it to the river. Last night's blurred moon smoked yellow, already new. I insist on making the sky into ink. People outside seem happy that it's clearing. Some days I admire, some leave me thinking. What had gods to do with Sarah's leaving? Angel or muse would be convenient. Names my lover won't see inscribed in the vision. continues to have its way with me. My shirt soaked in sleep. I woke early with fever to see a coral ring circling rooftops and crowns of trees, a pair of fiery black wings not disturbing the landscape. There was nothing to read like the message in Sarah's eyes she never wanted me to see, a fire that couldn't be doused. I shouldn't speak or interpret signs the birds haven't sent. I know she's gone. I need to let her be. It's no use waiting for the days to lengthen. The clouds will hold whatever light comes before the last gives way to indigo. Dark violet, almost black. Who's to say now we are settled? That the sky's changes won't hurt us. Who can tell us where we are if no stars break through? The two moons you left in the bed sheets, in the pillow, the impression of your hair, the faint rosette of blood on the blanket. This is the only landscape I know. brings the sky to the ground. I'm going to a swamp where dead trees gather. The white swirl no match for their silver skin, laced with water taken from the air. Nearly all of them still standing. What's fallen, I pick up, as much as arms can carry, back to the road where there isn't anyone. How much life is left in them? How much need rises up from a swamp of leafless trees and mud? eloquent in its way of asking nothing. Virginia, I lived near the Blue Ridge Mountains by a mustard field while the cows were calving, and turkey vultures wobbled in the sky. The room was spare. I don't remember sleeping. Sarah was still alive, gone a few weeks later, a place before or since. Everybody, let's give the poets another round of applause for everybody. We have some books for sale, and the poets will be signing them. So, um, thank you, everybody, for coming. If you could move your chairs against the wall, um, thank you so much. Okay.